Excellent, look at that. That's amazing. So there we're measuring movements of, uh, you know, 10 nanometers. Isn't that amazing? Can you see it? So, two direction. Can you see it there? And that's the movement of the, of the hairs. So we're actually projecting the hairs onto a diode and then looking at the light on the diodes and that's showing the movement. I work on hair cells. These are sensory cells in the ear, in the, in, inside the ear, that detect sound and they detect also motion of the head and, uh, and acceleration. But the ones we work on detect sound and we're interested in how they detect sound, that is how the sound is converted into electrical signals and how they uh, distinguish between different pitches or different frequencies in the sound. It's like a prism. In the light prism, you, you shine white light onto the, onto the prism and this then breaks up the different colors and you can project them as Newton showed. The, the, the cochlea behaves like an acoustic prism where you can input wideband noise, which has got all frequencies in it, and the hair cells will separate the frequencies along the cochlea. So low frequencies are present at one end and high frequencies are present at the other. The ear is not just passive. It doesn't just receive sound. It actually has an amplifier built into it. So the amplifier makes sound louder by 100 to 1,000 times. It sharpens our frequency sensitivity. It gives us a very broad dynamic range so we can hear everything from dropped pen to a jet plane taking off. When the basilar membrane is set into motion, the 16,000 hair cells along its length are stimulated mechanically the hair bundles, which are the tiny clusters of filament protruding from the top of the hair cells, begin to oscillate back and forth. And the hair bundles have, between each of the fine filaments, a sort of a filament called the tip link. And that tip link is attached to ion channels that can open and close. So every time you hear a sound, the cells that respond move back and forth. And as they do, the little gates open and close, letting ions flow into the cell and setting up an electrical response. That electrical response is then propagated across a so-called chemical synapse to the nerve fiber that carries the information into the brain. The real turning point in my work was the development of the huge investment of the scientific community to try to decipher the human genome and especially to decipher the human genome analysis. I got very interested in the auditory system because this is a sense for communication in humans through language and music. Basically, we hear with only a few thousand sensory cells. And this precluded in a biochemical or even classical molecular genetic approach to be able to identify the key molecule involved in sound processing. But in such a situation, the genetic approach is perfectly appropriate because its efficacy is completely independent of the number of molecules or cells being involved in a given process. I am very much interested now by the cortical process, how sound is processed at the cortical level. I would like especially to focus on auditory um, cortex plasticity because, of course, we need to restore hearing at the peripheral level. But brain plasticity is absolutely essential to take advantage from this restoration. Without brain plasticity, the result will be very poor. I would say our research has two long-term goals. The first one is rather abstract, which is understanding at a molecular level exactly how the ear operates, how the channels operate, how the little strings, the tip links attached to them, operate, and so on. 
The other goal is at the other extreme, which is trying to deal with deafness by regenerating hair cells so that people will no longer have the problems associated with different kinds of hearing loss.